On April 1st, 1990, the Ultimate Warrior did something that nobody had done in close to nine years. He scored a clean pinfall victory over the most omnipotent force in the world of professional wrestling, Hulk Hogan. It was in Toronto's Sky Dome at WrestleMania 6 that Intercontinental Champion Warrior defeated WWF Champion Hogan in perhaps the most famous title-for-title -title bout that there has ever been. More importantly than the physical title swap was the changing of the guard on the company's depth chart. After running for six years with the Hulkster as the be-all and end-all, Vince McMahon had Hogan pass the torch to Warrior, a man that was coincidentally six years his junior. At the 1990 SummerSlam, Warrior would defend the WWF Championship against Ravishing Rick Rude, marking the first world title match on any WWF pay-per-view that Hogan neither wrestled in nor was a ringside party to. With Hogan working the semi-main at SummerSlam, Champion Warrior was slotted as a number one, positioned as the theoretical Hulkster of the 90s, the head of the new class. One year later at the 1991 SummerSlam, the Ultimate Warrior was suspended from the WWF right after he'd wrestled in the evening's main event. And it would be more than seven months before fans saw him again. This is Behind the Match. The main event in question teamed Warrior with Hogan against a diabolical trio known as the Triangle of Terror, an anti-American pro-Iraqi Sergeant Slaughter and his two cohorts, 50-something General Adnan and near-50 Colonel Mustafa, better known as the Iron Sheik. Putting aside the expected Can Hogan and Warrior Coexist melodrama and the X Factor that was the debuting Sid Justice who was acting as guest referee, the result of this match was hardly in doubt. Dubbed the match made in hell, the handicap contest shared co-billing with the storybook wedding of macho man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth, the contrasting match made in heaven. Ultimately, SummerSlam 91 was a night of positive blow-offs where the baby faces stood tall, the sort of feel-good show that closes one book before flipping open the cover of a new one. But all was not so rosy within the WWF, particularly in the main event tier. By the time SummerSlam 91 rolled around, Hogan was champion once more. He defeated Slaughter at a star-spangled WrestleMania 7 that spring for the title, two months after Slaughter dethroned Warrior at the Royal Rumble. The torch passing from Hogan to Warrior didn't quite work out the way that WWF had hoped. Business had taken a downturn with Warrior on top, and his lone reign as champion came to an end at Slaughter's hands, with a copious assist from a still heel savage. So, what went wrong with Warrior's reign as champion? Some believe that a lack of well-built heel challengers diminished his prospects as a defending champion. Others, like Bruce Pritchard, feel that Warrior's character and presentation lacked the tangible humanity of Hogan. As while Hogan was on top and larger than life, he could still kind of sort of exist around us normals in the real world. To put it another way, Hogan was at least somewhat relatable, while it was probably a little bit harder to connect with a guy that raves about distant galaxies, forsaken skeletons, the fallibility of false prophets, and all that jazz. Thus, the transition of power from Warrior back to the once-replaced Hogan was completed at WrestleMania 7, with Slaughter acting as middleman. That same night, Warrior defeated Savage in a loser-must-retire match. Despite losing his spot as the tippy-top guy, Warrior was still seen as a vital piece of the WWF puzzle, even if it meant existing one notch below Hogan, the man he was meant to replace. Not that life was all that great for the champion. As the pieces were falling into place for the 91 SummerSlam, a Pennsylvania-based urologist named Dr. George Zahorian was convicted on eight counts of illegally distributing steroids and four counts of illegally distributing painkillers to professional wrestlers. It was through his nominal role as ringside physician for WWF events in that state that Zahorian could ply the wrestlers with drugs, and for doing so, he was sentenced to three years in prison. Understandably, this cast more than a few sideways glances at the wrestling giant. Worse for the WWF, Hogan's name appeared in Zahorian's documents, and the indisputable face of American professional wrestling was subpoenaed to testify in the trial of the summer. 
However, the judge later excused him from testifying, sparing the WWF a great deal of potential public embarrassment. That's why it was all the more bewildering that weeks after Zahorian's conviction, Hogan went on Arsenio Hall's syndicated talk show, where he claimed to have only taken steroids on three occasions, all under doctor's care, and solely to rehab injuries. It's not clear how badly things may have gone for Hogan and the company had Hulk spoken honestly about his steroid use, but to have lied in such a transparent fashion dealt a crushing blow to Hogan's public image. That take your vitamins quote he imparted on the world's youth lent itself quite well to the obvious jokes, it turns out. Bret Hart had stated in his memoirs that Hogan had told him that McMahon had ordered him to lie about his steroid use during the Arsenio interview. If that's the case, then talk about all-time backfires. The Hogan issue was just another headache for Vince. Six days before that ill-fated Arsenio appearance, Hogan's SummerSlam partner was giving McMahon a different sort of migraine. On July 10, 1991, the man then legally known as Jim Helwig penned a letter to Vince, expressing discontent and frustration with his lot in the WWF, in particular when it came to money and standing. Warrior attested that his attempts to hash out his issues with McMahon previously had not yielded definitive answers, and the former WWF champion felt like he was being blown off by his boss. At one juncture, Warrior contended that he was as responsible for WrestleMania 7's success as Hogan was, and he felt that he wasn't being properly compensated for a performer of his value. Amid the written venting, Warrior said, I paid my goddamn dues long ago. I need not pay any more. I've given everything, and never once was there a knock on my f door. He then laid out the terms of what he sought from McMahon. For starters, he asked for $550,000 to pay off his home, which he said would suffice as his WrestleMania 7 payoff, though he still called it not fair in comparison to what he figured Hogan would get. He also asked for four days off a week except for pay-per-view weeks, the same financial cut that Hogan earned for both pay-per-views and TV, along with other concessions, including the same pay cut that Hogan made from merchandise. In closing, Warrior made statements such as, I've tried to speak to you as a friend, but maybe I don't have the qualities you require to seek me out as a friend. And, whatever your decision, I can and will live with it. Till then, I remain home with one who cares. Three days after the letter was dated and three days before an uncomfortable Hogan began firing off whoppers, McMahon responded to Warrior with a conciliatory missive. He agreed to shell out the $550,000 for his performance at WrestleMania 7, agreed to the four days off a week, made a promise that nobody would ever make a higher percentage off the net of house shows and pay-per-views than him, and offered a higher royalty rate on both merchandise and his 900 number. McMahon closed out the letter by writing, I regret the turmoil you've put yourself through and you're agonizing over what you feel is fair compensation. And even though we have a difference of opinion over some of these matters, I'm resolved to work with you in the same honest and equitable way that I always have. Furthermore, I would like to express to you my deepest appreciation and admiration for you as a performer, as a member of the WWF family, as a man, and as my friend. The concessions offered by McMahon were rare ones after all. How many wrestlers achieved that sort of financial parity with Hogan, especially to that point? Aside from Warrior missing a slew of shows at the end of July, including two TV tapings due to what the Wrestling Observer newsletter termed a problem at home, the face painter do got to rejoin the touring troupe in time for the final push towards SummerSlam, where he and Hogan would do battle with that so-called Triangle of Terror. Funny thing was, for a main event match, the heels couldn't really have been any more inconsequential. The Gulf War had functionally been over since even before WrestleMania, and here was Slaughter, still kicking around in the role of hard-nosed American turncoat. He, Adnan, and Mustafa collectively wielded the forward momentum of a rusted-out car on blocks and could have been swapped out for any other three individuals from the roster. They were just there to take the Washington General's ass-kicking from the two top globetrotters, and that was that. Or rather, if you remember the 2011 Survivor Series, play The Miz and R-Truth to Hogan and Warrior's Rock and Cena. In fact, making this match even more irrelevant, Hogan and Warrior were both pretty much lined up for their post-SummerSlam rivalries. Though the dots wouldn't really be connected until closer to SummerSlam, New York-bound Ric Flair, also known as the real world's champion, good work there Jim Hurd, was clearly being set up to work with Hogan in order to fulfill Pro Wrestling's ultimate dream match. When Flair's impending arrival was first announced by Bobby Heenan the second week of August, Slaughter may as well have been an invisible man. 
As for Warrior, he was still feuding with The Undertaker, who, despite his popularity, had not really been promoted for SummerSlam in any form. Ditto Jake the Snake Roberts, who turned heel in order to align himself with The Undertaker in an unholy union against Warrior, following a vignette in which Warrior was left to die in a den of snakes. You know the stuff, Saturday morning children's programming at its finest. According to The Observer, with Jake still mending from a neck injury, Warrior was to continue wrestling Undertaker at house shows and the like into the early autumn, giving Roberts the time to heal up before he and Warrior would take to the ring for their matches together. Matches that never came to pass. As for the SummerSlam match in question, it felt like your typical low-exertion house show main event where you wait for the bumbling villains to run out of steam so that the heroes can finish the inevitable conquering. On a night where Bret Hart won his first ever singles title by defeating IC champion Mr. Perfect, Virgil avenged years of abuse from Ted DiBiase, the big boss man defeated the Mountie in a match where the loser had to spend the night in jail, and the Legion of Doom achieved tag team immortality, the main event wasn't really going to deviate from all of those good vibes. One last-ditch effort was taken to make the presence of Slaughter's faction mean something when Sarge and company were caught on camera trying to influence guest referee Sid Justice earlier in the night, but that was pretty much it. In the latter stages of the bout, Warrior chased Adnan and Mustafa up the aisle and through the curtain with a chair, allowing for Hogan to vanquish Slaughter, first with the powder to the face for reasons, and then the time-honored leg drop. Following the bout, Hulk gave Sid a bit of rub by sharing his post-match pose down with him. As the fans enjoyed Hogan's and Sid's moment, they had no clue whatsoever that when Warrior ran out of their frame of vision, he had also, effectively, run out of the organization. Sometime after arriving back through the curtain, Warrior was handed a letter, apparently written that day by Vince himself. According to the letter, he was suspended indefinitely from the World Wrestling Federation, effective immediately. The letter said, in part, You threatened to stay at home, thereby not even appearing at Titan's major summer pay-per-view event, SummerSlam. I had no choice but to accede to your exorbitant demands. This was a serious mistake on your part. Throughout the letter, McMahon dressed Warrior down for becoming impossible to work with, and he told Warrior that he was a legend in your own mind, while explaining just how much bigger of a star Hogan was by comparison. Miffed by the letter and the suspension, Warrior tried to quit the company, going so far as to send a letter of resignation that October. The WWF refused to accept Warrior's letter and felt inclined to keep him under contract until its expiration one year later. With his absence came the sudden need for reconfiguration. Undertaker and Roberts were both left without a new rival for the months ahead, and to remedy that, McMahon tried coaxing Randy Savage out of retirement. Though wrestling retirements have shorter life expectancies than Mayflies, Savage was apparently insistent that he wasn't going to be returning to the ring, determined to serve as color commentator and nothing more going forward. Dave Meltzer wrote of the McMahon-Savage impasse that there was an apparent threat of removing Savage from commentary if he didn't return to the ring. However that situation ultimately played out, Savage did return to wrestling before the year's end, engaging in a deeply personal feud with Roberts. The rivalry actually began at the SummerSlam wedding reception, with Roberts and Undertaker violently crashing the party shortly after a horrified Miss Elizabeth opened a gift box to find a live cobra inside. As for Hogan, his star continued to fade among the negative headlines, and business wasn't exactly strong with him on top for his third go-around as champion. When he lost the title to The Undertaker at that year's Survivor Series, the crowd was roughly split 60-40 in favor of his younger opponents, and the pop for Undertaker's victory was a little louder than maybe some would have liked. Hogan's house show series against Flair began running out of steam, and plans for a rematch between the two at WrestleMania 8 were scuppered altogether. Instead, Hulk would work with a post-heel turn Sid in what was half promoted as Hogan's farewell match. With the WWF and Hulk both under intense scrutiny due to a handful of scandals, the red and yellow were going to fade from the palette for a while. To everyone's surprise, however, Hogan's sunset was a new dawn for Warrior, as the face-painted powerhouse made a shocking return at Mania's end to save Hogan from both Sid and Papa Shango. Warrior had just signed a new contract three days earlier, brought in to try and anchor the babyface side of the ticket alongside new world champion Savage. The same Savage that had retired one year earlier and partook in a quaint kayfabe wedding at the ensuing SummerSlam. So let's recap, shall we? At WrestleMania 6, the Ultimate Warrior assumed the mantle of the WWF's top babyface star by vanquishing aging hero Hulk Hogan, winning the WWF Championship in the process. 
Within a year, Warrior is deemed as an unsuitable successor, and the belt is ultimately transitioned back onto Hogan at WrestleMania 7 via the camouflaged conduit that was Sergeant Slaughter. As a consolation prize, Warrior beat Randy Savage into retirement that same night, which is fine because Savage wanted to retire. In the months ahead, Warrior gets suspended, Hogan suffers damage to his public image, and Savage, like Al Pacino in Godfather 3, thought he was out, but got pulled back in. Come WrestleMania 8, Hogan finally exits stage left, Warrior returns to essentially try filling Hogan's shoes again, and becomes the number two babyface behind the guy he just retired one year earlier. Pro wrestling truly is a strange business.